All right, good afternoon. Uh, we have our next speaker here, Jason Mill, and he's going to be talking about uh, using finance to create a new department. Uh, he's a partner at, uh, at co -found, and co-founder of uh, GiveWP.com, a WordPress donation plugin powering more than 40k plus active installs. He works on managing the business growth, buys the ads, and does pre-sales support tickets too. Grew up in Jefferson Park too. And though he lives in San Diego, now he's a Black Sox. Go Black, Black Sox! Sox. Black Sox. <laughs> <laughs> Go Blackhawks. Uh, they didn't make the playoffs, so no. No. hockey's over. <laughs> Let's give a warm welcome to uh, Jason. everybody for coming to my talk today, using finance to create a new department. So it's actually really nice that Dre spoke this morning. Did everybody see Dre? Everybody in the room? Wow, incredible. I think that, I was like, well, how am I going to time I talk to Dre? You know, he's done so much success. He's had so many life experiences. He's had so much in his journey. You know, his whole thing was talking about change. And it was like, yes, yes, yes. Because this conversation is all about change, too. Uh, a couple things about me. Uh, my name is Jason Canell. I work at Give. Currently, I'm the head of finance. Uh, as Ben mentioned, I also work on some pre-sales tickets. I buy some ads, and uh, we work together as a team on lots of things. A couple disclosures before we start talking about finance. Um, I went to the great University of Butler University out in Indianapolis. I worked really hard for four and a half years to get a political science and history degree. Like I think Ben said earlier in the talk, to like maybe like figure it out once I got out to uh, San Diego. Uh, but here today, we're here to talk about finance, and I think the maybe there's some CPAs in the room, but maybe there's not too many. So we're kind of on the same page here. Um, and hopefully today, my goal is to help level up your understanding of finance, and also, most importantly, help you consider that, hmm, uh, maybe I could do finances, uh, do finance as well. So... Um, go through this little talk, talk a little bit about how we built a new uh, department at Give. You know, I'm so inspired by WordPress. I remember meeting Devin and talking about WordPress and thinking about the plugins. I remember going to um, read about Matt and talk about uh, how he set this goal. Um, well, I think about it, changing the world, right? To democratize publishing, to give a voice to the voiceless. And it's always a good level set before we step back and talking about growing huge companies and taking over the world and taking out SAS, uh, that we remember why we're all here. Um, we're all here to democratize publishing, um, we're all here to give a voice to the voiceless, and we're all here to improve the world, which is I'm really exciting because we're here to work too. Before I get into talking about working backwards and what finance means, I wanted to talk a little bit about business. And I'm really excited to talk about business because when I first joined WordPress about four years ago, I had the opportunity to go to WordCamp in Orange County and listen to Steve Zane and a couple other folks talk about business. And they were trying to communicate the importance of education around business and finance. This is a report. So there's this gentleman that came into WordPress last year. His name is John Maida. He's the head of design at Automatic. Like, whoa, we got a rock star into the WordPress community. He comes out with these design and tech reports every year. This is from 2017, in which he noted that the number one thing that folks want to learn about is finance. Yes, that's me, right? 2018 recently came out. I encourage you to look at it. He's got an interactive map. He's got digital stuff. So if you take anything away from this presentation, go look at this website, designandtechreport.wordpress.com. And he's got 2017 and 2018 there. Guess what, folks? In 2018, it came back, and the top 10 skills needed for designers and startup business. That's why I'm here. So, who's a designer in the room? We got some designers in the room? I can design this presentation, y'all. I'm not a good designer. I got kicked out of our class. Flavia did. She's on my team. So, thanks, Flavia, for putting this presentation together. One of the really important things about our business and how we build our company with finance is that everyone's involved with working backwards and everyone has a voice in building um, what we're building. Real quick picture, that's my team. All right, action items that you're going to take away. We're going to talk a little bit about what working backwards is and how we use that to build a customer success department. Uh, we're going to talk about this customer success manager dilemma. 
Like people are like, geez, it isn't finance so boring. I'm like, well, that's like the CPA stuff. In finance, we have lots of a freedom to make things up. We're going to talk about futures and ratios. We're going to talk about getting the buy-in from my teammates. Um, I'm not the only one on the planet that works at my company. So certainly if we're going to make big decisions and create new departments and make big investments, everyone needs to be in. I'm going to talk about failure, success, and then I'm going to talk about my rap song again, again, and again. <laughs> All right, so what is working backwards? I said before, you know, I was never a CPA, and I didn't come when I got into the WordPress place from a, um, I'm going to manage the accounting and doing the forecast. I came from a place of, gosh, we need to figure this stuff out because we got to build this thing. And that was the place um, that I came from. And one of the things that I've always really done in life is try to visualize things. I think that was taught from, um, like, I love bowling, I love golfing, I love fishing. And all those things, you have to kind of visualize what's going to happen, whether the fish is going to hit the hook or that ball is going to kind of come around the tree, right above it, and move on the right side of the fairway, all these visualization things. I think that, hmm, in many ways, helped me out for finance because I created this little concept called working backwards. And like everything in life, I, I don't think I created it. I just like identified it and was like, yeah, this, this is going to work for us. Because at one point, when you're trying to create new things and get buy-in, people are like, so like, what is this going to do? And, well, if I look into the future and think about it, well then, well, maybe it would do that. Or uh, maybe it would do this. And that, that's really kind of like my view of finance and working backwards. And I think finance, in terms of working backwards, it has a lot of, I used to say, well, finance has no rules. If you want to be in, if you want to be in finance, that's great, because you've got to make things up. Well, I kind of changed that thinking and you know, iterated it a little bit. And I think finance has open rules. Certainly if we're involved in tax or uh, we're dealing with complex issues, you certainly would want to have a CPA involved and have an attorney involved and get those advice. But if we're just talking about building stuff that doesn't exist, well, frankly, we don't need them. Right? We, we put that aside and say, you can do the tax stuff. We're going to be playful, have our open rules, and figure this, uh, figure this thing out. So that's kind of how I've always approached uh, finance. There's a big dilemma, and there's an elephant in the room. I think, and there was an elephant in the room when I, uh, when I started at WordPress, like, um, and working on WordPress, and working on the WordPress project, and working on the, the Give plugin, and having all these customers come in, and, and looking at all the thousands of active installs that we have, and it was like, hold on, we don't, call, we don't talk to people, we don't, we don't call them, but there are customers, and they pay us, and they love us, and they give us five-star reviews, and, you know, occasionally we meet them at WordCamps, but, like, we only talk to them if they're upset, and they're like knocking down our door with a support problem. And I said, you know, maybe, maybe that's not the way that we want to do it. So as I began to think about what we call customer success dilemma, and I said, well, well, team, what we want to do is we want to create a department to start calling people after they bought our products. I'm like, okay, well, let's talk to our members about that. And as we talk to our members about it, we continue to hear that what you really need to do in the marketplace is you need to go get a rock star salesperson because he's going to call your customers, he's going to create all this loyalty, and it's going to be amazing. And we thought to ourselves, and we considered the things that we know, and it became this really important dilemma and decision that we had to make about change. So this is like, well, gosh, it's like five months ago. So I'm sitting around in November, and I'm like, man, we just broke 8,000 premium customers. Uh, everyone loves us. We're renewing at 75%. But like, we don't even know who they are, but well, we kind of do if they need a support problem, and they're kind of located, but we need someone to call them. We think it should be a salesperson. It's like utter confusion, right? There's like no answers. We couldn't make a decision. And it was like, I was like, well, that was just like what Trey was talking about, indecision. So what we did, or what I did more specifically, is I did this, thought about this little chart, and I said, well, based on my experience in WordPress, you're either going to have a lot of sales experience where we're finding this person for customer success, or you're going to have a lot of WordPress now. It's like not everyone's Mac Bromwell, not everyone can do everything in the world. So I said, well, what, what do we really need? Do we need someone that has a lot of sales experience, or do we need someone that has a lot of WordPress experience? And I like to have fun with uh, finance and forecasting. So I created these two little names, WP Good Vibes versus the Sales Slayer. And what we're going to do is we're going to go through some of the financial strongman and forecasting that we did to determine if we should go with WP Good Vibes to build this new department and methodology, or if we should go with 
um, sales slayer. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? I hope it does. I hope it does. So, first thing we do is build a straw man. Like, so that's like just making stuff up. So we're sitting around. All right, good vibes or sales slayer. Here we go. So let's think about the things that we might want to measure, right? Because like finance is about math, I think. I haven't, we haven't talked about math. An important thing in finance is not all, always about math. We started making things up. We said, well, what about calls to renewal? If a sales slayer makes a call or a good vibes person, what might happen? Well, what about like calls to audience segments? If the sales slayer knows lots about education, because he worked in the education sector, well, that WordPress person, they may not know about this, right? And we start quantifying these things with actual numbers. WP good vibes to renewals, good vibes to upgrades, upgrades to calls. We started creating all these things. So I worked with my teammate, Michelle, and um, creating all these different things. Who are you going to bring aboard? Who are you going to bring aboard? Are we going to bring aboard that good vibes person? Or are we going to bring aboard um, the sales slayer person? So these are things that we create in our mind that don't go on a spreadsheet, uh, or that may go on a spreadsheet, that may not, just to begin thinking about the process of how do we build? What kind of investments do we want to make to build to find that um, right person? So those are the things that we thought of. In the end, we came up with a couple different things to measure, and we're going to talk about measuring them. We came up with sales training. We wanted to measure that. We wanted to measure WP WordPress and team training. Maybe we'd call that culture fit in some big organizations. <coughs> We wanted to measure effectiveness at WordCamps. Imagine that, WordCamps. Here we are today. Who loves WordCamp? <coughs> you know why I love WordCamp? Because y'all love WordCamp too. I mean, why don't you go to another business conference? You're like, who loves coming to Dreamforce? Everyone's like, God, I feel terrible. I want to say, well, I $1,500 and I learned nothing. We learned about phone calls. Is good advice going to be able to make phone calls? Well, the sales slayer is going to do way better. We'll talk about that. Emails. Who can write more emails and send them faster? Right? Who's going to actually connect with people? Like, I'm a great salesperson, but no one ever talks to me. That's no bueno. How many people contacted? How many people do demos? How many people take care of force level support? So we got these different things. Oh, yeah, revenue. That's important in this thing, right? The purpose of this department is to increase customer loyalty and increase revenue. That's an important thing to democratizing generosity for us, to democratizing publishing for WordPress, and frankly, to create those really high-paying jobs to allow us to have careers for decades in this industry. So, this is my WP Good Vibes spreadsheet. And for the sake of time, because this is a little shorter presentation than the last time in Phoenix, I put all the numbers up for you so you can look through them and get super confused. All right, so, <laughs> someone asked a question in, in Dre's speech, like, do you forecast five years in the future? Well, for this position, we just forecasted four months. And I think that was pretty easy for us because you can kind of see into the future four months. Like five years, I think that's a little bit harder. When people ask me that question, I'm like, do a year. And just stick with that and do budgets and actuals every month. So we did four months, January, February, March, April. And you can see all these different things that come down. And I quantified each one of these things based on numbers. Where did these numbers come from? I made them up. They didn't come from anywhere but my experience and some basic math. And I think that's really important when you're thinking about finance and building a company, is that you can do it. You can make the numbers up and see what they look like and work against them, and then iterate, 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 right? Again, again, and again, and keep doing it. So a couple things on the good vibe side that we thought that were really important in making this decision. Well, first and foremost, like coming in, good, good vibes isn't going to know much about sales. So there's lots of sales training. We've got sales training going on. But I've got good vibes in month two attending a WordCamp. And most importantly, because Good Vibes knows WordPress, day one, they're on the phone calling the customers, right? That's super important, right? You come in and immediately, even though they can only make 84 contacts and generate a little bit amount of revenue at $2,400, in the first month, they're already talking to our customers. Make a little note, that's really important in the math based on looking at the futures of how math works, right? Get a few months ahead, you're going to be in a much better position based on this forecast. So another really important thing about this sheet that you want to look at is the demo rate. 50% of good vibes, again, this is all made up data, I'm making this up, 50% of good vibes is going to talk to the 84 people, they're going to talk to a lot of people, 50%. I'm like, well, why do they talk to more people? Well, because they don't sound like a salesperson on the phone, because they're not, right? Right? We're in WordPress because we're in WordPress. 
We're not a salesperson because we're not, right? So they get to talk to 50 people, and you can see the math running, right? And we run the math right through the sheets, and uh, they're, they're just made up numbers, folks. All right, Sales Slayer, keep that in your head. Sales Slayer doesn't really need one month of training. He just needs to hang out with me for 15 days, and we can figure out this product thing. He can read a bunch of product spreadsheets, and those product spreadsheets, he's got them, right? Because he sold Salesforce. He sold Classy. He worked from some agency and sold pay-per-click. He knows what he's doing. Well, here's the problem. That guy, he's not calling my WordPress customers for several months, in my opinion, until he really understands WordCamp. So what happens? So Sales Slayer comes in, and he's like, yo, I need to get on the phone. I can make 100 calls a day. Well, in my mind, as I'm forecasting this, using finance, finance here, I'm like, well, stop. You know, I don't want to put you on the phone. You don't even know the difference between a theme and a plugin. <laughs> well, you can trade me. Well, can you? Like, I literally learned in the last talk that the most important thing about support is the other plugins that are impacting support, right? Like, I worked for Gib and didn't know that, right? <laughs> How about this sales slayer that came in, right? So super important, we don't put him on the phone for two months. No revenue in month one, no revenue in month two, but you can see in month four, once he actually starts making phone calls, he's two times faster in generating that revenue. It's like, they hit 5,000 here, he had 5,000 here, but he's twice as fast. So if you would put in another variable like you remove training, the, the math would totally change, right? So when you're doing with this, I always say like, be super playful. Like, well, what if the sales guy could like watch um, every video about community on WordPress TV and all the great things, and he's like, I got it. I understand, I understand WordPress. Those are all the different variables that you can create as you're creating these spreadsheets and frankly playing with the numbers, like you're playing, like developers are playing with blocks, right? Jason's playing with sheets. <laughs> all right, so here's the annual revenue, good vibes versus sales slayer. Boom, good vibes wins, this is great. He generates more than $40,000 of income and in finance we make decisions based on numbers, not based on feelings. So that's really important. I feel strongly about WordPress I feel strongly about democratizing publishing. I made this decision because of that number at the bottom of the sheet. Because that's my job to lead the company and in that role. So I think that's a really important thing is that if after the end of this journey and my decisions in my math, though I may change them a little bit, if this was the 101,000, hopefully I'd be earnest enough to make that decision. But guess what? When we put this all together, and we thought about it. Now, I wanted good vibes to win, so maybe there's some bias there. But at the end of the day, in our forecasting, we made that decision. We said, you know what? As we're going to build this customer success department, because the elephant in the room is that none of the WordPress plugins or theme shops ever talk to anybody, then we need to do that. And that's what we did with WP Good Vibes. I think one of the really important things is that there's this radar. I call it the bees radar. And I think when people think about getting on the phone, people, like, freak out. Like, I don't know if you guys do, but, you know, sometimes I do. Well, this person wants to have a call. They have a 714 area code. They're in rural Pennsylvania. Like, whoa, they're, like, really different than me. I don't know if I want to call. Maybe I'll just email them. I bet they'll get my email, you know? Um, they probably like email because, like me, uh, they don't like to talk on the phone either. Well... That was a big thing about hiring WP Good Vibes is that we didn't want to bring that rough shot bull and trying to shop person into our company. And I think it was really about getting those teammates and creating that buy-in. So as I projected this stuff and thought about this, what we did in our company was we met up. And I continued to push with feasibility documents and continued to share my thoughts around how we would build this department based on finance. I actually never showed any of that other stuff to my team because those are things that I was internalizing to make my own decisions. I think it's really important when you're working on teams to work alone to create big ideas and then to present them to your team. Uh, that's, uh, that's really important for making really good, strong, um, really good, strong um, decisions. So I always like to start with questions, like I said, and get curious and make it up. I'm a fisherman, and uh, this is probably one of the best ways to fish. You can actually do this right in uh, San Diego when the Grunions run. Do you guys know about the Grunion run? Well, if you don't take anything other than that Tony Ma or John Maida thing, Google Grunion run. That's pretty neat. You can take one of these nets out and catch a bunch of Grunion in, uh, in San Diego. Long form feasibility, baby. Does anybody know what feasibility is? All right, so feasibility is a document that I put together to show my partners 
that we should then hire WP Good Vibes versus Sales Slayer. So we went through this straw man, I made a bunch of stuff up, I created a, a spreadsheet that had a bunch of more made up stuff up numbers, and then I made a decision that's really going to impact our organization. I can't go to my team and be like, hey, I just made a bunch of stuff up, um, let's do that. <laughs> right? So you have to create another document, right? So uh, this requires work, which is another thing to bring up, is that as you think about building your company, the folks at Ninja Forms, they did a talk last year here about partners. You know, you want to think about bringing in people that complement your talents, right? Because we all have different, unique talents that can benefit our goal of democratizing publishing and giving a voice to the voiceless. So long-form feasibility, baby. How to make a feasibility doc. No math here. Four things to do. Credit curiosity. You know, one of the really important things is asking peers for key insights. So I called my friend Eric Hayes. He works over at Powell's, and I said, hey, Eric, we want to build this department just like you. How did you guys do it? And he said, we got 80 salespeople pounding the phones, and if people threat to, uh, threaten to quit, we threaten a lawsuit. I said, oh, good advice. <laughs> we should definitely hire the salesperson. You know, we asked our mentor, and he said, hey, you know, if we're going to build a sales department, who should we focus on? He said, well, you probably want to hire salespeople. So we did, some, we did some key peers, we talked to outside WordPress, and we did it a lot. And we did this for a long period of time as we were thinking about building this new thing. What's the new thing? It was calling folks on the phone, right? That was the new thing that we were doing. We are picking up the phone and calling our customers. You know, when we think about failure success, does it even matter? You know, someone told me, he's like, it doesn't matter. We're just going to keep going. And I think that was a really important point about what... Um, what Dre said in the talk, he talked about iteration, iteration, iteration. Like, does it really matter that it was 101,000 versus 40,000? Like, does it really matter that I created that straw man? Does it matter that my straw man might be different than your straw man? It doesn't matter for anything. You know what matters? Is I was able to convince my partners to create a department based on this feasibility doc. So that's super important as you are creating that um, feasibility doc. It doesn't matter today if you fail or succeed, because we're going to do it again and again and again. When we do our financing with our budgets and with our actuals, we do it every month. And we might spend a little bit this month or spend a little bit less ne next month, but we're constantly doing it over and over and over again. One of the really, really neat things about um, the organization um, that I work in and the teammates that I work with is that well, none of us are CPAs or financial experts, but all of us are using finance in our departments. All of us. We all work backwards in every way. And I think that's really important as you're thinking about building a business, is that you may not want to have um, a finance person do the finance. Because maybe the perspective of how we build this community is maybe a little bit different than how some other industries and communities have built their um, business. We work backwards everywhere. And I think that's really, really, really important to um, share on working backwards. Here's an example, I stole this from you, Matt, of a spreadsheet that is created in one of our um, systems. And this looks at an entire year of support. So we're jumping out of finance we're still thinking about working backwards. We're still thinking about running ratios. We're still thinking about doing all the things that you learn in managerial accounting, but we're doing it in support. Imagine that. You can't read these three things, so I'll read them to you. I got to get really close to read them too. But you can, you can see you've know, got capacity. Uh, that's the red line. I got to look here. I can't even read them there. The red line here is capacity. The blue line is the ticket and sales ratio. Oh, and then the orange line, which is my most favorite, maybe it's a little bit yellow to you, it's like a puma yellow, is the resolve ratio. So these are three different ratios that the support team and Matt and his team are leading that allows Matt to determine, guess what folks, how to build, how to hire, how to create jobs, and how to grow the WordPress community. So by utilizing working backwards, even though Matt doesn't call it working backwards, that's what Matt's doing, <laughs> and utilizing these ratios, we can make some really, really key decisions. I think when I'm looking at this, when I'm looking at, at this from a finance perspective, you can really see in month 11th and 12th our capacity going through the roof. 
But you know what's really exciting about that as we work backwards? That resolve rate basically stays right on par. So what does that mean? That means as our customers are asking for more things, we continue to get more efficient. So maybe in the future, when we do our ratios, that could impact something, right? It's not only happening, not only happening in finance. It's also happening in support. In many ways, it's happening in development. Not only does it happen on a yearly basis, for our company to be successful, for our company to grow, it has to happen on an ongoing basis. So people always ask me, Jason, so like, so like you go into PayPal, you do those transactions, you hook up QuickBooks, like that's like 25 minutes. And I'm like, yeah, that's about 25 minutes. I can do that in 25 minutes. I'm like, but like I gotta stare at the spreadsheets, I'm gonna delete a bunch of things and make things up. I'm gonna make our grow rate 7% rather than 3%. And it's very important that you spend a lot of time doing it. So we spend maybe, let's call it 18 hours a week doing finance. Maybe that's probably what I do. Maybe 22. On support side, I think basically your whole job is finance because you're looking at numbers constantly. And look at the detail that's coming out from a financial perspective. Finance being math, not being tax, making this stuff up. These are real numbers. For every 50 sales, customers create 68 tickets. Our replies to resolve is 2.6. So we need 68 tickets. We'd send 177 replies. Handle time is 9.33 minutes. So that's 1,650 minutes to handle 50 sales. That's about two days of premium sales that give. Each tech has about 1,650 minutes a week to do priority support. If that's not creating a feasibility doc, I don't know what is, right? This is a feasibility doc right here that was created in support, and Matt doesn't even know it. So I challenge all of you, because I said, well, how many people are in finance? And I was like, what the hell is finance? I'm not, I don't do taxes. This is, this is finance, and this is forecasting, and this is happening. And I encourage you to think about that in your role. And think about finance maybe a little bit differently. Think about it as open rules. Think about it as less rules, not more rules. Now, I think if there was like a financial lecture in here at City College, I might not get a very good grade. But I gotta tell you, it worked. It really worked. Like it did. Like last year we had, I don't know, a half dozen employees, now we have almost 20. Right, I mean it really worked. Before our customer uh, renewal rate was like 69%, now it's 77%, right? Before we used to sell only 10% of our pro bundles, that's agency licenses, now they're 16%. So like regardless of what you think about anything else, like it worked. And I think, I think in many ways, like that's the WordPress way. Like we just figured out how to make it work based on the resources that we have, based on the customer's needs that we had, based on the timelines and things that we were given. Right, and we're all a little bit different. Right, like we came into the business and we didn't have a big investment, so we didn't have a lot of cash. We had a lot to make different decisions. We said, you know, we don't want to bring on investors, so our burn rates can have to be a lot lower than other SaaS companies. Right, so these are all the things that we did based on what um, on what we did. I wanted to provide you a couple different uh, things in addition to um, working backwards and doing financial forecasting, because people say, well, what are the tips that you can give me, Jason, to better run? to better run my business. So, a couple things here that I think are really important. I've got three key spreadsheets that I'm looking at on a pretty regular basis in my role in finance. And they're on the left. 18 month rolling budget and actuals, FY 2017 forecast, and that's a mistake. It should say FY 2018 budget. And that's a much bigger mistake than you might think, so I'm gonna talk about why that is. So those are three sheets that I roll up my most on the day to day. So I'll explain them a little bit. The 18th month forecast literally looks out every 18 months and it's constantly moving every month. And most of those numbers in there probably aren't that on. They're made up and they're always changing. Like if we're like, we're gonna come out with a new product, I change that number. If we say, hey, we're gonna hire more support staff, the number changes. The 2017 forecast, previous year, is I can go back and be like, well, how'd you do, dude? Like, did you get within 5%? Did you totally miss the software licensing cost? Like, how did you, how did, how did max ratios around 9.33 tickets and 1,650 minutes work to those sales? So we can go back and look at what we did. I love the 2018 budget the most. So when I talk about forecasts and budgetings, again, this says budget here, not to confuse anybody. But when you do a forecast, you're like playful and curious and you make stuff up. When you do a budget, you're like in the military, buttoned up, and very serious because you got to meet your budgets 
Because what we're doing is we're having courage and we're taking big risks, right? Big risks. We're not taking little risks here. We're taking big risks. So with that budget, no risk taking on your budget. Be conservative on your budget. On your forecast, be playful. Be curious. Those are different sheets. They work in different ways and they serve different purposes. Um, this renewal churn thing is a really big thing these days. Like if you go onto these big websites and download their sheets, which are really great, you'll see a lot of people talking about renewal and churn. Like, thank you, Pippin Williamson, and all the people that decided to go to auto renewals for plugins. From my perspective, it has a profound impact on our ability to continue to democratize generosity and create jobs. Why? It's a simple answer, folks. Because we have more revenue. Right? And more revenue begets more investment because y'all are paying every year automatically. We don't have to be like, can you please just give us your credit card? For the folks keeping score, we were at like 15% renewals. Now we're at about 70. So, And the really interesting thing about that too is that when we look at math, our refund rate after installing the customer success team actually dropped, which is like all the assumptions that I made in my straw man that like people are going to renew less cost more and not like us, like the result was the exact opposite. It's like, wow, gosh, that's really interesting. It was the exact opposite of what we thought. I think you might find that a lot in life, especially when you start thinking about how finance uh, might play, uh, might play into, into your business. I do a financial health snapshot. Uh, hopefully I can do that more, but that's a, that's a snapshot that I provide to my teammates and managers at the company for how the uh, companies are doing. Uh, just, like, uh, just like all the departments, we make sure we report on a weekly basis so that we really know what's going on, um, what, what's going on um, in the business. I think craving curiosity and being playful is probably not something you might hear in a traditional finance talk, but I would encourage you that for us, that's what made it work. Like, it might not work for other people, but that's what worked for us. That's what worked for us, and frankly, if it worked for us, well, then we're just going to continue doing that, right? We're not going to change course because it works. And finally, again and again and again, I think it's really important to uh, learn from others. I think listening is a skill that we could all benefit on. I think going to meetups and work camps, certainly doing scrubs and um, having tests, and you should do it again and again and again. I'm uh, Jason Knill. I'm from GiveWP. I really love WordPress, and thanks for coming to my talk. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yes? How much do you rely on your forecast to adjust your budget for the next uh, quarter? Quite a bit. Quite a bit. You know, I think like one of the really important things is that we're in this big build and investment mode. So the forecast really is constantly changing. I think one of the big challenges is that when you're in build mode and you're constantly investing, it's very important that you are a little bit more lenient on how you would manage your budgets because there are always things that you aren't going to know that are going to come up when you're taking big risks. Like the more risks you take, the more opportunities you're going to have which could impact the budget. So I really like trying to be pretty strong and being like, this is the budget, this is the revenue that we're working against. But I think you do have to run at the forecast when you're like, hold on, like everything changed. What does this mean for the business? Because you still got to keep doing everything that you were doing over here while you're trying to figure out that changes. So trying to keep them separate, I think, was, is a super important thing. I think it's really hard. And frankly, I think the best way to do it is just use Excel, because that, that can allow you to create those pivot tables and the different tabs so that you can say, hey, we're going to grow up 1.6 rather than 1.3 or something like that. Um, so I would say yes. If, if, if your forecast changes aggressively, you probably should change your budget. And maybe just on a quarterly basis. Um, but we're a small team, and we don't have like huge, we have no debt, so there's no like, we don't have this nut that we have to meet other than expenses. So there's not like this little man, it's like, we got to pay our bills, and we have to find that $80,000 to pay for that investment. So that's another thing, is if you keep that out, then you, the rules change a lot. If, there's no, if you've got expenses and you've got to pay someone, like, I might suggest not doing this way at all. Because it, it, is, it might not be as buttoned up as if you, if you had that going on. Good question, please. Any other questions? Yeah. I was in software a good chunk of my career, and biz dev, one of the things that I did was brought in licensing, and I always encourage people to do the customer contact. So the missing part in there that I didn't hear was, you were con did you contact people that 
didn't buy, that demoed, didn't buy, downloaded, didn't buy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is I've always been a believer that everybody in the organization is a salesperson. And especially in a small organization, everybody sorry, on the spot here, but, you know, <laughs> should be capable of making two, three, five calls to a client. I'm the CEO, I'm the this, I'm the that. And making those calls personally, especially during the startup phase, because at a certain point, everybody becomes so wrapped up in their roles that they forget about who the customer actually is, why they're buying their product, and, and that relationship between them kind of dissolves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So two questions there, I think. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the second question, does everyone get involved in sales? Um, I would say that based on the nature of our team, it isn't like um, everyone is believes in the mission of democratizing generosity and everyone that touches a customer because frankly customers are really smart and they can go online and figure it out for themselves. Like no one even really needs to sell. We just need to provide the ability for a customer to have a great understanding to make a decision. So everyone is naturally in sales because that's just how we baked in the brand. Now sales in the WordPress ecosystem does not exist today. Like Go find a plug-in shop or a theme shop that has someone that's a business development person. Like, it doesn't exist, right? It, it, say what you, there's partnership people, like big, big companies, but maybe at the host is where you'd start to see the sales folks within um, WordPress. So baked into, the, uh, baked into the brand, and no one's really doing sales because our customers are smart enough to make their own decisions. That second question is more, or the first question I think is a little bit more profound in that how do you handle the growth of people that don't buy into our freemium model and just use our free product. That's a WordPress problem that, that's a challenge we all gotta solve, right? We don't know that much about our free uh, customers that are downloading our products, and certainly, um, if we knew more about them, we not only could sell them, but we could help continue to accomplish our goal of democratizing publishing and bringing a, a voice to the voiceless. We see doing that in 2019 or later 2018. We bring in a sales team and really think about going out to new people, and I think at that point, it really begins about the conversation of WordPress more than it begins about my products. Because what we need to do to build my product is to build up WordPress. It's not really to build my product, because once you discover WordPress, you're going to beget using WordPress products, and then we're kind of there. So that would be more my perspective, but I definitely think that having people making outbound calls to people that didn't purchase would be great. I don't think that... It's like, a, it's like a bug in WordPress. I don't think we can really do that because we don't know where our free customers are. And I think that's also important because that's what open source is. Like, it's okay we don't know who our free customers are. It's all good. You know? So that's just one of the parameters that we have to work around. Any other questions? Yes, sir. How much transparency do you provide with the entirety of your team around budgets, actuals? financial goals, et cetera? Yeah, really good question. So um, I'd like to say as we share as much as we possibly can. Um, so average job size, total revenues, renewal rates, you know, all of that shared with the team on a regular basis. And I think the team would be defined as everybody within the organization that touches give, that's a full-time employee. So for the most part, everybody would, would know what's happening um, with the company. Certainly if we're making decisions about investment or future products, we try to keep those uh, at hands arms because you never want to, uh, what's it, um, like where you make a decision and then backstep it. We want to be very purposeful in our decisions and um, when we make a decision that's what we're going to do. So try to keep those things uh, in our pockets until we really know what's going on. Awesome. Well, I guess that's all. Thank you so much for coming to my talk.